So Charlotte is muted. There we go. Let's try that again. Thank you. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy law. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us absolution and remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Let us say together the Veniti found on page 44 of your Books of Common Prayer or on page 2 of the Service Bulletin. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Our salvation. Let us come, come before, before his presence, his presence with thanksgiving, thanksgiving and, and show ourselves glad in, in him with songs. For the Lord is a great, a great God, God and a great, a great King, King above all gods. gods. In, his in his hand are the corners of the earth, the earth and the strength, the strength of the hills, of the hills is his also. The sea is, the sea is his, his and he made it, made it. and his and hand his prepared the dry land. O come, come, let us worship and fall down, down and kneel and before kneel the Lord our, our Maker. Maker. For he is the Lord, Lord our God, and we are and the we people are of his pasture and the, and the sheep of his hand. hand. O worship, o worship the, Lord the Lord in the beauty of holiness. holiness. Let the whole let earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge to the earth, earth and with and righteousness to judge the world. And, and the, the people of the tree. Okay. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and verses 17 through 22, found on page 746 of the Book of Common Prayer or on page 2 of the Service Bulletin. Let us read in unison. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endure forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took to rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for the, his mercy and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord and take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed to the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read together a song of praise found on page 49 of the Book of Common Prayer and on page 3 of the service bulletin. Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou for the name of thy majesty, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holiness, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and dwellest between the cherubim. Praised and, and exalted, exalted above all above forever. forever. Blessed art thou on the glorious throne of thy kingdom. Praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven. Praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praised and exalted above all forever. A reading from the letter, letter to the Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read together the Song of Simeon, found on page 51 of the Book of Common Prayer, and on page 4 of the Service Bulletin. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light, to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the gospel according to John. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. In the chapel of St. Nicodemus in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, there is a light bulb that never burns out. The light bulb is the chapel's only one. It hangs unshaded from an electrical cord in the low ceiling of that tiny worship space carved out of the rock under the church's first floor. I first heard the story of the chapel's miraculous light bulb from Daniel Rossing an Orthodox Jew and former Israeli government liaison to Jerusalem's Christian communities, who led a group from my seminary on a tour of the Holy City, oh, more than 15 years ago. As Daniel guided our group through the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we marveled over the ancient icons and the lavish tapestries. I placed my hand on the very spot known as Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. And I entered the tiny chapel over the place that tradition identifies as his tomb. As we walked around, Daniel told us about the patchwork of agreements covering ownership and use of the church. The church is divided among six groups of Christians and Anglicans didn't make it in. But these churches are the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Armenian, Ethiopian, Syrian, and the Coptic churches. We listened as Daniel explained the cardinal rule governing the shared space of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. If you maintain it, it's yours. That simple rule was designed to preempt conflicts among Christian groups, but it can't guarantee that squabbles won't bubble up from time to time. If, for example, the Ethiopians are responsible for a staircase and the Greeks for the courtyard at the bottom of that staircase, who should mop the short bottom step? Is it part of the staircase or the courtyard? If the Greeks mop it, Will they slowly work their way up the rest of the stairs? And if the Ethiopians clean it, will they eventually claim the courtyard? The distasteful possibility that bearded men in cassocks will attack each other with mops and pails of dirty water is always present at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, unfortunately. So those images were in my mind as we followed Daniel into the faintly lit chapel of St. Nicodemus, which is the subject of a perpetual tug of war between the Armenian and the Syrian churches. Pointing to the single light bulb hanging from the church's ceiling, Daniel said mysteriously, see that light bulb? It never burns out. He went on to explain that when he was working for the government, he would occasionally receive a telephone call from the Armenian patriarch in charge of the chapel. Now remember the Armenians and the Syrians share this chapel. So the Armenian patriarch would call to say the bulb had burned out. Daniel, my brother, the patriarch would say, I just want to let you know that the bulb has burnt out and that at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, I'm going to get one of our priests to change it. Now remembering the cardinal rule of the Holy Sepulchre, and knowing that the two churches had never come to an official agreement about who controlled the chapel of St. Nicodemus, 
Daniel would warn the patriarch against changing the bulb. Before the end of the workday, he would receive another call, this time from the Syrian patriarch. Same conversation. The light bulb's burnt out. Tomorrow morning at nine, we're going to change it. Just thought I'd let you know. Just before midnight, Daniel would go over to the church and be greeted outside by its doorkeeper, Mr. Nuseba. His Muslim family has been opening and closing the church's doors for centuries because none of the Christians who worship there trust each other enough to keep the key. Mr. Nuseba would smile and say, Daniel, I thought I might see you here. The two men would go into the chapel of St. Nicodemus. At that point in the story, Daniel fell silent. Early the next morning, Daniel would call the two patriarchs and gently but firmly rebuke them for having sent him down to the church in the middle of the night when, in fact, there was nothing wrong with the chapel's light bulb. Each of the two patriarchs would apologize and promise to warn the priest who had made the false report to be more careful next time. So the light bulb in the chapel of St. Nicodemus never goes out. Accepting the discreet help of their Muslim and Jewish friends allows two groups of Christians to avoid not only the possibility of having to worship in darkness, but also a potentially violent altercation. The disputes surrounding the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are just some of the modern versions of divisions that go back to the earliest days of the church. After all, Christianity began as a family fight between Jews who accepted Jesus as the Son of God and their siblings who did not. Today's reading from John Gos John's Gospel echoes with the pain of the two group separation in the first century after Christ. But it also points to the possibility of overcoming those divisions. Our Gospel reading starts with a conversation already in progress between Jesus and Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee and religious leader who straddles the fence between church and synagogue. Nicodemus is attracted to Jesus's words and deeds, but he has a hard time believing that Jesus could really be the son of God. He comes to visit Jesus under the cover of darkness, hoping to reason his way through this spiritual struggle. Instead, he receives a reminder of the mystery that lies at the heart of faith. Just before today's reading opens, Jesus tells Nicodemus that anyone who wants to see the kingdom of God must be born from above or born again. The Greek text could be translated either way. Nicodemus protests. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? He's looking for a logical answer to questions of faith. And he doesn't understand when Jesus tells him that the work of the Holy Spirit can't be contained so neatly, that the Spirit blows where it chooses, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Or, as the letter to the Ephesians that Robert read for us this morning puts it, faith is a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that none may boast. The letter continues reminding the church of why they have been saved, why they've been made one with God and each other. We are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So God doesn't love us because we do good works. We do good works because God loves us. Human beings are prone to forget that ultimately salvation is up to God. And our forgetfulness has often led to tragedy. Over much of the church's history, Christians have taken the beautiful promise Jesus offers Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We've taken that promise and we've used it as a weapon against those who have not received the gift of faith in Christ. 
That kind of warfare is still going on today as some Christians attack non-Christians and Christians attack each other. It is true that Jesus's promise is followed by a sobering warning that we should take seriously. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. But it's important to remember that 2000 years later, it's impossible for us to understand the context in which those words may have been spoken, repeated and transcribed. Many biblical scholars believe that statement reflects the pain that gripped John's community as their Jewish neighbors rejected both Jesus's claim to be the son of God and the church's commitment to spreading the gospel. What was good news to Christians was heresy to their ancestral faith. And the message that started as good news eventually turned into very bad news for some, as many of our ancestors in faith forgot that all people are subject to God's judgment. Not just our ancestors forgot that, if we're being honest. Christians targeted Jews for centuries, and some continue to do that today. And beyond the anti-Semitism that you and I rightfully reject, lie so many ways for you and me to judge people we find lacking in some way. It's hard for human beings to avoid boasting, hiding our own insecurities by pointing a finger at those we're sure just don't get it. The people we point to may be members of a different faith, another branch of the Christian vine, or our own congregation. They may be people whose politics are far different from our own, people we find hard to talk to or hard to even imagine talking to. But as Christians, you and I know that God's word wasn't sent to feed our impulses toward judgmentalism and self-righteousness. It's meant to nourish the presence of Jesus Christ within us and to bring us into closer communion with him the other members of his body, and God's children outside the church too. It's meant to remind us that any good we do is a sign of the Holy Spirit moving within us, and that God is constantly working to convert each of us to a deeper faith and to the kinds of loving actions that are the fruit of that faith. So remembering that, what call can we hear today in our gospel text. I hear Jesus's words to Nicodemus as a challenge to ask ourselves a few questions. Do we have the faith to live our faith? Can we trust Jesus Christ enough to relax into his promise of eternal life while being gentle with the Nicodemuses of this world? and with ourselves when we resemble Nicodemus? Can we be patient, not pulling or pushing Nicodemus off the fence where he's so precariously straddled, but inviting him joyfully into our worship, fellowship, and study? Can we trust that God will impart the gift of faith more and more fully to all of us in God's own time? Do we show our commitment to live as Jesus's disciples by investing our time and energy into caring not only for the church, but for the community beyond the church and especially its most vulnerable members, people who are being targeted unfairly for whatever reason? And are we ready to do that work with other people of goodwill who want to join in even if we don't agree with them on every theological or political point. Gentleness, patience, joy, trust, compassion, these are signs of the Holy Spirit's presence. These are indications that you and I are doing the deeds God has prepared for us. And so for the grace to discern those deeds and for the Spirit's power that equips us to do them, thanks be to God.
Thank you, Rhonda. Let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page four of your service bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth. Thy saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with thy Holy Spirit. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which giveth life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, and all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Spirit, that all the cares of occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving found on page 58 of the Book of Common Prayer or on page 6 of your service bulletin. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine and unworthy, unworthy servants, servants, do give, do thee, give thee most and hearty thanks, thanks for all thy all good goodness, and loving kindness to us and to all, to all men. We bless, we bless thee, thee for our creation, our creation preservation, and, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thy love, love, the redemption, redemption of the world. world by our, our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, for the means of, means grace, of grace, for the hope, for the hope of, glory. of glory. And we beseech, and we beseech thee, thee, give us that due that sense, due sense of, all of all thy mercies, that our hearts, our hearts may be sainedly thankful, thankful, and that we show that we forth, forth our praise, praise, not only with our lips, but in our, our lives, lives, by giving, by giving up, up ourselves to your service, service, and by walking, by walking before thee, holiness, holiness and righteousness, all our days. Through Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord, Lord. 
the tomb with thee and the Holy Spirit. The all honor, glory, world without end. Amen. A prayer for Saint Chrysostom. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.